And we are back. Welcome in. Uh, this is the Sabbatarianism podcast. My name is Justin Hoos. I am your host. This is a podcast made by Sabbatarians for Sabbatarians. I once again have back with me Mr. Richard Davis. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Justin. All right. So today, as promised, we are going to start going through Romans verse by verse. Uh, it's uh, something I really wanted to do with you, and, and uh, other people have, have talked to me about wanting to know more about this book, and I, I think it's, uh, if not the most misunderstood book, it's certainly amongst them. Would you agree? I think so. I think, and it's one of those that, like Peter uh, said, Paul writes many things that are hard to be understood, and people twist, twist them it. up. Yeah. Yes, yeah, exactly. Uh, so it's one of those things that I found. You really have to have a whole legal understanding of what went before in order to put these things in order and understand what he's saying. Yeah, and I think uh, there's a couple of things that I want to start with here before we get going. Is Paul uses the word the law or law. Mm -hmm. in many different ways mm -hmm. and i think as we go through here we need to try and ferret out which law he's really speaking of when he uses that word because i think it trips people up i know it does me so okay this this is one of those areas where as i said you need to know the back history of the law yeah all the way from genesis 1 up to this point in order to ferret out what he's talking about yeah if you already have your own ideas about it and you open this book and begin to read it you don't have a clue what he's talking about i mean the law can mean the ten commandments it can also mean the uh, law of marriage yeah it, it could mean the police yeah <laughs> i mean the pharisees were the law here they come to check out our circumcision uh it, it it can be used in several ways. There's yeah. even ways here where he said there's a law within my members. He's not talking about a written code. He's talking about an order or, or progression of things that occur within the human, human nature, the human mind. Mm. It works in this manner, and then there's another law which works in that manner. It's not, you're not talking about the Ten Commandments or any of the laws of God. Or the law of Moses or any of them. Yeah, yeah. he's just talking about this is the order in which my nature pulls me. Yeah. So you have to really know the, the history of these things and the law and how it developed in order to get at what he's really saying. Yeah. So we'll try and kind of <clears throat> talk about that as we go, as, as we use that word. Let's try and uh, kind of explain what, what your interpretation of that word being used is. my understanding. Is. Yeah, because yeah. that's another thing. I mean, Richard, you're a man. I'm yeah. a man. Uh -huh. You know, we're, we're fallible. We can be wrong. And mm -hmm. we're going through a lot of your interpretations, which I think are excellent and very helpful to our community because God's really blessed you with a lot of understanding. But you are still a man. Yeah, you know? and, and I'm not perfect, but, yeah. you know, I'm not a woman. A woman might look at it differently. She might say right. the law means uh, the Ten Commandments, but it also means what her husband says Yeah, in her home. Well, that's not necessarily the law of God. <laughs> <laughs> and that's uh, true. And that may just be the order that her husband commands according to his own selfish wants or something. That's yeah. You, so you really have to have a, a understanding of the whole back history of it in order to really understand Paul correctly. And I'm still working on that, but I know a lot more about it than I used to. Yeah. And you're willing to share it with us and we appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. We appreciate it. So the other part that I really wanted to cover before we get going is something you had made mention of before and, and really kind of opened things up to me. And all of my studies of Romans from other Church of God sources, uh, other Sabbatarian sources, they make the assumption or the or they put forth the thought that this book is to two different types of people, to Gentiles and to Jews. He's speaking to both, and he kind of oscillates back and forth between the two. But you put forth that, no, that's incorrect, that it is actually a 
book written to Gentiles exclusively, and there is a reason for that. Would you share that with the audience? Yes, well, he says down here in chapter 1, uh, where, verse 13, uh, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. Right. And he has no address address here to openly to Jews, but he begins to talk about being a Jew or being a Gentile. So there's, there's you can understand why there's some confusion. But if you look back in Acts chapter 18, I'll just start in verse 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. And, of course, that's all it says about that in Scripture, but Josephus gives a pretty detailed explanation about what happened back then and the causes of it. Josephus was a Jewish historian of that day. Yeah. And all the Jews were driven out in one manner or another, not all the same From way. Rome. From Rome. So, uh, and that was about 57 to 59 AD. So I think the consensus is that Romans was written just a few years after that. Okay. In 60 to 65 or something like that, A.D. And so technically there weren't any Jews in Rome. When so this he's occurred. writing to yes. Gentile believers. Who make their boast of being Jews, as he will say. Okay. Now that's... <laughs> that's a common thread. That's a that common we... <laughs> thread or a common <laughs> attitude among Jews and the Gentiles. Yeah. That the way you become a Jew... You know, especially ever since the Jews denied the northern kingdom and the other Israelites by saying, if you're not part of us and here in the holy place, God's sanctuary, you're not Jews or you're not Israelites. Yeah. So only we are the Israelites. That's how that evolved. And we went through that in the paper on the, the history of the covenants. God talks about that quite a bit in Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Hosea, other places. But... The, pr pr the attitude that you have to obey the Jews' law, and if you accept their religion and their law, you become a Jew. Or you become favored by God. Yeah, favored by God yeah. and, and sanctified in that way. And that spirit and that attitude had bled over into the church. We're the true children of God because we're circumcised. Well, and that's what Messiah was fighting too, right? I mean, he the right. Pharisees were teaching that you needed to become like them in order to be yes. justified, to be and all the stuff. given eternal life. And he came to thwart that. And now here it's creeping back in. And we've read about it in Galatians. We're going to read about it in Romans. It's throughout the entirety of the New Testament of, of this type of attitude. And, and they're to all them, fighting it. To them, that included everything they'd added to it. Of yeah. their doctrines and their Good beliefs point. and everything which Christ condemned. And that still is there. I mean, it, yeah. to this day. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it certainly was there in that time. So to a believer in Christ, when you see that, where he says you become a Jew, if this or that or the other, think you become a true Christian because you get circumcised, because you keep a holy day on the right day and the rest of them are all false Christians. That's the spirit and the attitude he was dealing with here. Right. In a general, general way. Yeah. All right. Well, you want to jump in here and get going? Okay. Chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. Now that's a mouthful. Yeah, it is. If you notice that last sentence, it says, Through him, Christ, we have received grace and apostleship. For what purpose? For obedience. 
not lawlessness, or do your own thing, for obedience to the faith. The faith is a your belief and your actions which come, that you practice which come from that belief. And he really works on that word faith in, in mm-hmm. this entire book. He's working off of that in a, in a kind of a juxtaposition to just the law. Yeah. Well, you can, if you have a f- faith in something, then it shows up in how you act, what you do, how you relate to God. Your heart. How you relate to others. And it can be seen among anybody mm. around you among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. Verse 8, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, having request if... By some means, now at last, I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both you and me. What's, what's he meaning here? Um, he wants to impart to them a, a, some spiritual gift. So that they may be established or better off, and so that by this mutual interaction of faith between him and them, both of them can be edified. Okay, strengthened. Which Yeah, which is what our faith in each other through Christ that's in us should do. And that's what we're doing here yes. every every Saturday, yeah. every Sabbath. Yeah. Um, we believe that when... Christ is in each other, then we're more assured in that as as we come together and as we share that. Okay. Now, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. There's that statement we talked about earlier. That's right. He labels them. I'm a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and unwise. So as much as is in me, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you, who are in Rome also. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. And that addresses what we just spoke about couple of minutes ago okay from one faith to another and and is that has that from one person's faith to another person's faith that's christ from the faith of christ that sent us both okay for the wrath of god is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness Okay, and that's where I'll just pause there. That word in one translation, the one I'm holding here, says, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Well, it goes without saying anyone who wants to suppress the truth is an error. Is a liar. But that's not what he's talking about. Yeah. If you look up that Greek word, and I don't have it before me, but it, it means to hold down intently, to not let something get away. It's the same word Paul used when he spoke to Timothy and the Thessalonians, places where he said, prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. Now, that doesn't mean suppress. Hold fast. Cling intensely to something. What he's saying here is you have truth, but you hold fast to it in a way that's unrighteous. Mm. Okay. Go go back over that again, please. Okay. He's saying that all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold fast to truth, but in an unrighteous spirit. And that's what he's going to talk about here. Now, you've explained to me that right here in, in the beginning of chapter 19, because the end of that sentence right there is actually a comma. Yeah. Right? And now he opens up a parenthetical statement. Which will continue to the end of chapter 1. Okay. And then the first word in chapter 2 is, therefore... To which clean, which to, is a continuation. Yeah, which links what he said there to what he's about to say. 
Okay. Okay. So we'll look at that because this is a complicated summation of what happened to mankind from the Garden of Eden that yeah. he's about to hit on. Right. But he's saying you hold fast to truth, just like in the Garden of Eden, they glorified the wrong thing. Mm. The knowledge of right and wrong or good and evil was very good. God said everything he created and put there was very good in its own use. But they held fast to the to wrong, the wrong thing, thing at the wrong time. And an unrighteous attitude and spirit, as though it could glorify them. And just as Satan had, I mean, he thought that's what made him as good as God. And that's what he told them. Yeah. And God is saying, no, you got it upside down. Okay. Unless you have my Holy Spirit that's in the tree of life, even the knowledge of right and wrong or good and evil can only make you a self-centered, self-righteous person. That human spirit of itself doesn't have the capacity to do it. You have to have the right thing the first. Holy Spirit. Right. And so that's where he goes because that, verse 19, may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things which are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they, these people who do this, are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. He's going back to the beginning. So the, all the days are these people that are holding on to the truth unrighteously. From the, from the beginning of creation. Okay. Yes. Including Adam and Eve. That's right. They had saw that the knowledge of right and wrong, that knowledge of good and evil was there to make them wise. It was good. It had its good purpose. So they glorified it in themselves. And Satan told them to do it. God's lying to you, he said. He knows in the day you have that, that's all you need to be as good as he is. And they held it in unrighteousness, which means that, they, they wanted the wrong thing. They that, wanted to be like God instead of serving God. That's they, right. They wanted it for an unrighteous reason. Well, it was self-righteous. Yeah. And vanity. Yeah. Okay. And they believed the lie that that could make them that like was God. was God. Yeah. <laughs> okay, not God. Okay. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Then professing themselves by that knowledge to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. We see now here he's talking about how from that moment, they took the knowledge, then because God removed his spirit and his understanding and his presence in them, they began to degenerate in their thinking. And they glorified okay. creation, the creation. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creation rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For the reason God gave them up to vile, for this reason God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women engage the natural use of what is against nature they exchanged exchanged the, yeah. okay so what is, what's meant by i mean just women wanting to be with other women yes is that what this is talking about yes it's it's because he goes on to talk about that with yes, men that's right okay likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lusts for one another men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due and what does it mean by receiving in in themselves the penalty of their error? It means that both spiritually and physically and psychologically. They were rotted. They began to rot and degenerate in themselves, their spirits, and those around them. And they couldn't have any offspring. Yeah. You, you might notice that men can't have children, contrary well, to <laughs> yeah. belief these days. Well, that's but, Satan's objective Yeah. to get rid yeah. of the human race, to reduce our numbers, like our population. Uh, politicians today are trying to do. Yep. 
And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, all deceit, evil mindedness. They are whispers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who, knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Okay, so that's, all these different things, that's not, that's not putting that all on just homosexuals. That's, no. again, talking about these people the, the total, that are holding to the wrong thing. Yeah, when, in other words, think of it like this as a basic foundation. You don't glorify God's love among one another and what it really is. You glorify something else. And in doing so, you detach your actions and your deeds and your faith and how you practice your life from that foundational thing, which must be there. You're building on a, everything on a wrong foundation. And he is just showing here that as they got worse and worse, God pulled himself further and further less away. Less and less Holy Spirit. Yes, to where they're just like animals. Right. Pulled by the most vile, evil, Satan-influenced things that their bodies and minds could compel them to do. And take a look out your window these days. Yeah. Therefore, so okay. this is the picking up. So let me read that's, that. That's right. where he stopped there. So for the wrath of, wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold fast to, to the, the truth, truth in unrighteous. unrighteousness. Yes. And then he talked about how then their their lives, their spirit, their actions began to degenerate down to where they couldn't even see themselves. And now he's picking that up and saying, therefore. Yeah, having seen that, you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge others. For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same thing. And he's not talking about, you saw somebody kill somebody, or you kill somebody too. He's talking about, the same thing that these people did that he just got through talking about. You are glorifying the wrong thing. You don't have the right to judge as a Christian other people. God does that. Christ does that. But by judging, uh, he's saying here that condemnation, condemnation, like yes. you can't have eternal life. It's, yeah. it's not saying you're doing wrong and I don't want to be any a part of that. Yes. That's not the type of judgment that's he's talking about. That's judging your this. actions. Right, okay. A, a, a condemnation on those people, I can't have anything to do with them because they're not circumcised. Oh, they don't have their holy day starting on the right day. <laughs> oh, they do this on the Sabbath and I wouldn't do that. Yeah. Or any of the They believe that list one goat is Satan and one goat is Messiah. And yeah. So I and, can't be around them any longer ever. And just add anything that the Pharisees added to it. It is this kind of self-righteous, putting yourself in God's place and thinking like the Pharisees thought that God has handed being God up to them and then just making your list of do's and don'ts that you go out there and afflict on everybody. As if you are God. Yes, as if you were God. Right. He's saying when you glorify the wrong thing, God is pulling his spirit away from there. And again, he's building on this premise that you talked about in the very beginning, that they were glorifying themselves and becoming Jews. Yep. And he's sitting here saying, this is this is wrong. And he's mm -hmm. just going through line by line of why that is wrong, how that's wrong, what it's going to lead to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. They're the chosen people. Right. The, 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 They're only ones that are truly loved that, by yeah, God. Yeah, the only, yeah, only sanctified people. For we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O man, who judge these practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance 
But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each one according to his deeds eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now I'll just stop right there. What he's saying here, and, you know, and just re and reading this myself, in the context, he's saying you're condemning these people who do certain things. And yet, you remember five years ago when you didn't know any better? Yeah. Were you condemned then? If so, how'd you get where you are now? If God wasn't still with you and patiently working with you in your growth in order to enlighten you fully. And if you had things wrong with you five years ago and now you've corrected them, how do you know you still don't have some things wrong with you that God is going to correct five years from now? That's right. So you don't have any business. You can't like the Apostle Paul said to the Corinthians, first Corinthians, for I don't know anything against myself, but that doesn't mean anything. God is the one who will judge that at the proper time. And it's not my business to go around doing that to others either. Now, this is not, as some would think, an effort to say, well, anything and everything is, is, is right and wrong. There's a... There's a, a different right and wrong for every Christian. No, there's only one right and wrong. But our understanding and our relationship with God and our growth is an individual thing. And only God judges his servants. Yeah. Romans, well, we'll get to that in Romans 14. He <laughs> you heard about the quote. He concludes quote. with this. <laughs> You're not the judge of God's servants. And I'm not the judge of God's servants. And to one who professes Christ as their Savior and believes in keeping his commandments, like he said, and walking according to his ways, their understanding and knowledge of that at any particular time that leads them in a certain path is between them and God. Well, and I want to keep harping on this, that he's not talking about just judging a person's actions. He's, he's talking about condemnation. That's right. Yeah. That's important to keep, yeah. keep in your head as, as we're going through here. Mm -hmm. Yes, I set down a list of do's and don'ts and make up my doctrines. And anybody is not towing the line, and I can't have anything to do with them or go to church. Because they're them. condemned. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and no, that is not an avenue to say anything and everything goes. And right. that's what immediately the, the uh, negative mind goes to. It means that we need to learn to love one another a little bit better than that. And I know that. And trust that God is the one leading. That's right. He's in charge, not He's me. He's in charge, right? Yes. Yes. And so that faith that we can have in one another, the righteousness of God is revealed. And our growth is revealed together by our faith in that and one another, regardless of our differences. Yeah. See, go back to the context. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> For as many as have sinned against the law, Verse 11, for there is no partiality with God. For as many of the sinned without the law, not knowing that they were sinning, will also perish without the law. And as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God. Now this is the opening of a big parenthetical statement here. Mm, okay. So, Let's remember where we'll be judged by the law is the end of that. And now he's opening up with for not hearers Go ahead. of the law or yeah. just in the eyes of God. But the doers of the law will be justified. OK, so he's, you know, he's saying that those who don't even have the law, they're just going to die on this earth. Their time is not yet. Yeah. OK, but they didn't know any better. They're not condemned. It, it's certainly at this time. But those who at least know the law have an obligation to fulfill it or to obey it. And if they don't, they're going to be punished by that. 
but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles, who do not have the law, by nature do the things in the law, these already not having the law are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. This will happen in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Okay, so accusing or else excusing them is the end of the parenthetical statement. Yes. So we pick it up as uh, as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. Mm-hmm. in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. That's right. Okay. Okay. And, but in that parenthetical expression, he's show, saying, hey, you know, people who've learned that, you know, they never heard of God, but they know that if they commit adultery, yeah, they might end up shot or with a knife in their back. So yeah. they say, well, that's a bad deal. I don't want to do that. And they really don't. And they they avoid it. Okay, they're fulfilling the law of God, even not knowing what it is. Just by uh, nature. Nature and happenstance. Yeah. Or, or yeah. I do certain things, I'm going to end up in a fight with my na- neighbor, and I don't like that, so I'm going to quit doing it. Yeah. The law works its own work among us. It will correct you itself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Verse 16. Go ahead and pick it up there again. Sorry. In the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. Indeed, you are called a Jew, and rest on the law, and make your boast in God, and know his will, and approve the things that are excellent, being instructed out of the law. Of course, that would have applied at that time as it does today, of anybody who accepts the law of God, as Jew see it, or as it was then. Now, this law that he's speaking of here, mm-hmm. this is the Ten Commandments. Well, I would, I'd say it extends beyond that. Even the law of Moses. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, uh, it could. He doesn't say specifically, but he's just making the point when you boast in the law, you're called a Jew. You're called a true Christian. The mm. Christians. Yeah, I believe God's law. I don't believe it's done away. Okay. Well, what are you going to do with it? Okay. Yeah. Is what you're doing righteous and a righteous godly action, or is it unrighteous and self-righteous? You see the point? And condemning others. That's right. Okay. So you, God didn't give us his laws to show us how to commend ourselves and condemn others, as he will say later on here. He gave it to us to show us how to love one another and love God. Mm. That's a powerful statement. Yes. And see, that's the different. Found, that's the foundational issue he's getting at here. And we say, wow. well, if we don't draw these distinctions between us and we're this and that, no, 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 no. Leave that up to Christ, because if Christ is really in you all or in you both, He'll work that out. Be patient, kind, long suffering, and leave Christ's dealings up to Him. Don't sit in His seat. Which is tough, but we yeah. we've got to do it. Yeah. So indeed, you are called a Jew and rest on the law, and you make your boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are excellent being instructed out of the law and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind and a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. You, therefore, who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? And he's, and this is, I think, a figurative statement. He's saying, you who say that a man shouldn't sin this way, is, is it possible that what you're doing here is just as sinful? Being a hypocrite. That's right. You who say, do not commit adultery, are you committing adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written. Wow. You know, it's what you're doing is not creating godly love between others. 
is creating division and strife and harm. I hear from a lot of people that aren't believers that they consider Christians to be absolute hypocrites. I can understand that. And that's that. what he's talking about right here. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. For circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you're a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Now, do you think he's speaking literally here or, parent or figuratively? I think he's speaking about the heart. Well, circumcision of your how heart does circumcision and... become uncircumcision? <laughs> yeah, physically. <laughs> yeah, he said it's, he's not. You can't saying, put it back on. No, you can't. For he's saying for circumcision, or which was the sign that you were God's people, mm. that you were the children of Abraham. If that, something like that is indeed is indeed profitable, only if you. Whatever you think makes you of God in your vanity if it's only profitable if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of it, then whatever you think makes you righteous has made you unrighteous. Has made you unrighteous. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted for, as circumcision? True. And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you, even with your written code and circumcision, or a transgressor of the law? He's talking there about the higher law of God. You transgress what the law is really about, which is God's love. Because you glorify these things, and you fight and argue and condemn, and it creates chaos among you. Wow. You've broken the true law of God, for he is not a Jew or a true Christian who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, or the true sign of you, that mm -hmm. you're of God is something outward in the flesh, but he is a true Christian or a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart and the spirit, and not in the letter whose praise, now that word praise is Jewishness. Oh, really? The word Ju Judah means praise. Oh, really? Yes, in Hebrew. It's from men. It's not from men, but from God. You're looking for your true righteousness, the righteous judgment of what you are to come from God, and not from men. So he's juxtapositioning here the... the the Jewishness of men in mm -hmm. circumcision and following the law versus true right. Jewishness, which is in the spirit the of your heart and, and, and changing love and God's the, love. That's right. Your changing of the heart. Yeah. The circumcision of the heart in the spirit. And notice he doesn't say as well as in the letter. He says, and not in the letter. Yeah. I've and, got that underlined in my Bible. Now, Obviously, what does he mean by that? that? Does he mean you can do anything you want as long as your heart's right? Because that's where people take yep. this. Yep. Or they accuse you of saying that if you explain what this really says. No, he's not saying that. He's just saying, put, don't put the cart before the horse. Going back to chapter one here. That's right. Not he's having saying, the wrong, th or holding fast to the, to, in, to the law in unrighteous way. That's right. And he's saying... If a person, and the reason I say this, that he's saying that is because he explains it later on, <laughs> chapter 12 through 14, that what he's saying is that one who has the Holy Spirit and God's love, I will glory in nothing but the cross of Christ and him crucified. I will glory, he uses that word, or boast. Sometimes he says it in nothing, but that love of God which flows between us and not in this or that little physical uh, elementary deed of the physical. And we that just read all that in Galatians. Given. Yes, we did. That's exactly what he's saying here. Whose praise or true glory is not, or Jewishness is not from men, but from God. You know, God is more pleased with, he, you know, especially this was a time of trouble between Jews and Gentiles in the church because they were both coming to Christ, but from completely different backgrounds of understanding. A Jew who had known God's laws and a Gentile who had not and had a far greater path of development and growth required. And he's saying, don't 
as you gr- use the law and you grow to know the law, don't use it like a Pharisee on other people. Okay. Okay. <laughs> You're yeah. despising God's goodness who five years ago, when you didn't know anything about Christ, he led you to repentance. Now you leave that other person to God and you learn to behave in the right way. And it is that spirit of God that's both in you, that faith that flows from faith to faith that should be what binds you together. And where your differences are, avoid them, don't fight about them, but try to learn from each other and be humble and let God lead you both to understand. And know that the other man's being led by God too. Yes, you know? absolutely. Absolutely. And or woman. I, I got to throw that in there. Yes, the, the individual. <laughs> right. So chapter three. What advantage then has the Jew or what is the profit of circumcision? Very much. Much in every way. Chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. Now that's a statement which has been abused, especially in the churches of God. It doesn't say they still have it. Because as we've shown, they don't. Right. And actually, the Jew never did. They had Levi between yeah. the feet, and that's the only way they had it. But the reason that they have, that it's profited them much, is they've had God's law all around them from their birth. And, yes, and he's absolutely. They comparing that to the what Greek that, would that has be. not. Yeah. So they have an advantage. They have a leg up on you. But that doesn't make them you know, any more of a, a Christian than you, or vice versa. When I was just sitting here thinking that the Jew also had something to overcome of getting all the Pharisees junk out of their doctrine Absolutely. as much as the Greeks have of getting the the uh, the pagan the things. pagan stuff out of their <laughs> doctrine. We come right back to that, and that's what I harp on every day of Pentecost or every you know or every well feast of unleavened bread. We spend so much time trying to get paganism. Mm. out of our practices, but traditionally have kept Judaism or gone to the Jews to try to understand how we need to keep the law. And that's exactly the opposite. We should start calling that what it is. It's not Judaism. It's It's, Phariseeism. Yeah, it's Phariseeism. (laughs) Yeah. For what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unjust who inflicts wrath? I speak as a man, certainly not. For then how will God judge the world? You can't apply what's required of us to God. I've heard people say, God always keeps his law. That's the most ridiculous thing. What can God steal? <laughs> yeah. God owns all life. God can't murder anybody. He gives life, he takes life. It belongs to him. And that's what he's saying. If we were to pl- put true goodness to that standard, then how would God judge the world? And if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, that's how he leads it. And he's talking personally then. Paul was, and he said it himself, chief among sinners. One of the greatest witnesses of the power of God is that this guy, Paul, who used to be called Saul and was one of the chief murderers of Christians, at least in spirit, if not in deed, is not preaching the truth in the gospel. Now, and that's it not sounds a miracle like he still considered power. himself that way. Yeah, he does. He said he's chief among sinners. He said it in another place. And if God can use me in order to show forth his glory, wow. And you're going to condemn God? According to your standard, I ought to be in the lake of fire. <laughs> yeah. But God is able to do wondrous things when he sets his hand to it. And so we need to get our judging self-righteous spirits out of his way. Doesn't mean it's okay for us to do unrighteous things for good. And that's what some try to twist this into. That's within Judaism as well. Mm -hmm. 
For if the truth of God and liberal Christianity, yeah. for if the truth of God has increased through my, that word lie is the same word as unrighteousness. Through my unrighteousness to his glory, why am I also judged as a sinner? And not, we should go to the original King James here, and not as some say, let us do evil so that good may come. As we are slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, and their condemnation is just. So he's saying here, well, I'm not saying that we can do evils if good is going to come out of it. Now, those who lie and say that I'm going to say that, and their, their condemnation he is says just. their damnation is just in the original King James. What is the difference? Uh, there wouldn't be any difference. Okay. Okay. It's just that many have twisted this whole passage right here in order to claim that that is what he's saying. Yeah. Verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they all, that they are all under sin. As it, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongue they have preached deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. He just mm -hmm. wove together a bunch of quotes all over the Psalms and right there, right? Yeah, and to, in order to describe all of us. Okay. So which one of us can sit in God's place and judge the world or other people? Not one. No. Now that doesn't mean right and wrong changes. That doesn't mean we're liberal and accept everything. But it means we need to stay out of Christ's seat. Don't go sit where you don't belong. But that also doesn't mean that you have to allow it into your household or, no. or something like that. Obvious, certainly, actions. People profess actions are wrong. We'll go through that. That's talked about in the book to the Corinthians. There's certain things that are just obviously wrong to everyone. You set certain boundaries about who you're with and who you're not and what you'll practice and yeah. what you want. Yeah. Now, it doesn't mean you don't have standards, but arguing about matters of God's law and your faith in it is what these people are doing. How best to be a Jew. Yeah. Now, we know that wh whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Now, we talked about it in the, that in the original history of the covenant paper. The law is there, is there to show us how wrong Rotten we are. We are yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, it. That's its value. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. How do you know what sin is? The, by the law. That's right. That other tree, the one that had the Holy Spirit, the tree of life, that was where eternal life came from, not from the law and the knowledge of good and evil. Yeah. Don't get them out of place. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus." Now, go ahead. if we want to know really what he's talking about there, we go right back to the original promise the, that was left to us, the testament in the will, what God left us 
by the death of his son, and it's in Ezekiel 36, where he says to Israel, and then by extension to everyone else, you're not going to repent. You're not ever going to be just, but I'm going to clean you up anyway, and this is the way I'm going to do it. I'm going to take that heart of stone out of you, and then I'm going to put, I am going to put in you a heart of flesh. And then I'm going to call, put my Holy Spirit in you. And then I'm, through that Spirit, will cause you to walk in my ways, my laws and my statutes and my commandments like Father Abraham did, and bring you back and redeem you to me. It's not anything you can do by being circumcised or by anything else, but it doesn't do away with their true value either. You just can't get these things out of order. And if you do, you're going to find a certain degeneration in your relationships with God and your relationship with one another. It's like he talked about there at the end of chapter one over into chapter two. That's interesting how you put that. Um, the will, like a, a person that is willed something from their parents. Is, is that what you mean there? A testament. We talk about the New Testament. Look up the legal term of what a testament is. The testament is that section in a will that... I bequeath this to, to... Yes, what you get from this. So by the death of Jesus Christ, what would that mean to us? It means our debt is paid for our sins, and now God, through his grace and mercy, is going to clean us up. And this is the way he's going to do it. And you so that we can have eternal life. That's right, and be redeemed by him. For his namesake. Now that's the testament that's left to us. And if that testator, Christ, had not died, there'd be no place for it. We couldn't be justified. We couldn't be set upright before God. Wow. Why have I never gotten that? I've heard you and Neil talk about that. Why have I never soaked that in? That's, that's incredible. Thank you. That's what the testament is. Yeah. It's God who does that. And it's God who has done it through us in his grace. And it's none of our Sabbath keeping that's ever done it. Does that do away with the Sabbath? No. And he's getting ready to get into that. And Absolutely. we'll probably have to get that next time because yeah. he gets right into Abraham Yeah, coming up. Where is the boasting then? Where is What are you supposed to glory in? It is excluded. There isn't any as far as you're concerned or I'm concerned. It's in Ezekiel 36, where That's God right. said, I will do it's this. It's in what God has done by his grace and his mercy within us. By what law of works? No, but by the law of faith. If we believe in that and are willing to step out and begin to live that way. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified or set, set upright before God by faith, apart from the deeds of the law. And he'll go on to talk about that. Abraham was justified before God, probably before he ever heard of the Sabbath. Yeah. Just because when God said, hey, get up and get out of your land, and I'll do this and that and the other. And he said, okay, I believe you're God. Here I go. Yeah. All and right. certainly before he was circumcised. That's right. That is talked about oh, later. Yeah, he will yeah. talk about yep, that later. Yep. Don't put the cart before the horse. And the understanding of that is very deep if we're going to live our lives properly. We can't ignore right and wrong, and we have to make judgments of that in our life. According to our understanding, we have to stand firm on it. We have to find a way to let God do his work among all other mankind around us. Yeah. We, it's, a, it's a path we have to negotiate very carefully, because certain things we don't need to be around. Yes, sir. We certainly don't need to accept or be, you know, there's certain places that I don't go to worship because of the spirit and the attitude that's there. But and that doesn't mean you are condemning no, those folks. No, it's just not for me. It's just not for you. At this time, right. I must understand what God wants for me and uphold it and, and fulfill it. And, and you have faith that that God is working with them also. Yes, those people I must, that are I, worshiping in that place that you don't care to go to. Well... Some of them. Uh, there are others that I don't know God's not there. Okay. It's very clear. But there are those that uh, it's not edifying to me. Well, even them, those that, that don't have it, uh, God will work with them at some point. Yeah. 
and may be working with them now. Yeah. But he's working with me like, you know, and I have to, I have to go through that in my own heart and mind. God, where do you want me to be and what do you want me to do? You know, I know people who will only go to somebody who disagrees with them so they can enlighten them, so to speak. And it's not like that's ever going to happen, but it may here or there. I don't know. Everybody's got to figure that out for themselves. A lot of people do that. Everybody answers to God, okay? Yeah. Okay. Where is boasting then? Is it excluded by what law? It is excluded. By what law of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified or put upright before God by faith apart from or before any deeds of the law. Or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. See, there's an issue there that was going on. And even the promise of salvation was to all the nations of the world through Christ and not to any Jews or Israelites. We talked about that in your paper when yes. we went back and forth between, uh, what was it, Colossians 2 and Ephesians 2? Yeah. Okay. Since there is one God who will justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith, do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law and the purpose of the law and what the law is about and truly was there for in the first place. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Richard. Uh, we're going to go ahead and leave it off here. We'll begin with Chapter 4 next time. And uh, it looks like this is going to take us a few. <laughs> we just did three chapters, and then we're right at an hour. So it's, yeah, you it's don't do take us... Romans in a hurry. <laughs> no, you don't. It's going to take some time. Uh, but I want to take our time with this one. It's, it's really important, and it's helping me, to be quite honest with you. Well, it helps me every time I go through it. Yeah. Yeah. You've told me that. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for tuning in, and we'll be back next time to dig back into Romans. We'll talk to you then. Bye-bye.